Chapter 19. What's gone is gone. I ran down the 22 flights of steps, too fearful to take the lift in case Mrs Chen should arrive back unexpectedly and catch me in it. When I reached the front door, I checked carefully that no one was watching, slipped out onto the busy street and mingled with a passing group of pedestrians. The freezing air shocked me. It was the middle of winter. The dense, dull, grey sky threatened snow. I was glad I had taken the coat Mrs Chen had bought me, though what a waste of money it proved until now. I turned into the first side road I came to, initially on a level, leading me back behind the row of new apartment blocks where the Chens lived. This road suddenly dropped steeply and took me towards the derelict buildings I had seen from my bedroom window. I glanced back up at the new apartments, trying to work out which one was the Chens, hoping to wave one final farewell to Mrs Hong, but the windows were all blank canvases. As I drew nearer to the derelict buildings, I was surprised to see that though they were appallingly dirty and crumbling, several of them were still occupied. Their balconies hung with washing and cluttered with bicycles, tin baths, old stoves and other worldly possessions. A grubby-faced little girl waved at me from one of the higher balconies. I waved back and thought how lucky I was to have grown up with my father's luscious green terraces all around me, with fresh eggs every day, with the river running close by and the air clean and transparent. The road petered out. I turned right along another decaying street and was surprised this time to find a row of shops. Their owners trading as though nothing was happening around them and the new town above didn't exist. Was the attraction of a brand new apartment, a brand new shop, insufficient to tear them away from this squalor? Yet how could I even ask myself such a question? This was where their roots were. This was their home. I was looking at these people through the eyes of someone who had lived in a luxurious apartment for the past four months, and some of that must have rubbed off on me. I knew that I would not have questioned their decision to stay, nor even noticed the squalor before I had been exposed to the Chen's immaculate lifestyle. I walked faster, partly because of the sense of freedom I began to feel, partly because I did not want to attract too much attention. I turned down a quiet, narrow alleyway to continue my descent towards the river. Shortly, I came to the wasteland that had lain grey and melancholy as a backdrop to my bedroom panorama. The scale of it took my breath away. To the right and left, for as far as I could see, there was nothing but pile upon pile of dust-smothered rubble, the odd twisted pipe sticking up through it, as though searching for a vital puff of air. I started to pick my way across it, my progress slowed by the unevenness of the ground. Looking at the rubble more closely, in order to avoid treading in potholes or cutting myself on jagged edges, I spotted tiny fragments of the lives that were once lived where I now stood. A doll's head, a strip of blue material, an old shoe, a broken bowl. Ahead of me, I saw a man and a woman pulling at the rubble with their hands, as though they were looking for something. Had they lived there once? I wondered if they had left some indispensable part of their lives behind them, and were now engaged in a frantic search to find it. Or were they simply hoping to find treasure amongst the fallen landmarks of somebody else's life? I reached a path and quickened my pace again. It narrowed and began to slope abruptly. I followed its Miranda meandering line with my eyes. It led all the way down to the river, where a ferry was moored and dozens of people were milling around. My heart skipped a beat, nearly there, freedom, just a few hundred yards away. I broke into a jog. The path gave way to coarse grass on either side. Ahead of me, the ferry passengers were strung out along the path, large bundles tied to their backs. I realised that they were coming in my direction, that the crowd by the ferry had disappeared. I saw then that the ferry was moving away. Even as I realised that I had missed it, I kept running towards it in some vague hope that it might stop. Afraid you're too late, dear, the first man I reached said. There won't be another one till morning now. But there's got to be, I replied. Are you sure? Seven o'clock tomorrow morning's the next one. Nothing till then. The straggle of climbers passed me one by one as I stood in the middle of the path, gazing in utter dismay at the departing ferry. What was I to do? By now, the Chens might well be scouring the streets of the old town for me. It was late afternoon. Where could I go until the morning? The last of the ferry passengers walked by, several of them staring at me curiously. I hurried down the path and waited for them to disappear along the streets behind me. To the left of the path, some hundred yards away, the remains of a small dwelling protruded through the grass. When I was sure nobody was looking, I scrambled over to it. The stubs of the walls were just high enough, if I lay down, to screen me from the path and protect me from the bitter wind. I decided to stay there until darkness fell, then to find somewhere in the old town to spend the night. 
With my coat wrapped tightly around me and my bag clutched in my hand, despite my fear of being found and the constant noise from boats labouring along the river, I fell asleep. It was twilight by the time I woke again. The surrounding peace was punctuated every so often by warning sirens from somewhere along the river, but otherwise all was quiet. I left the safety of my hideout and made my way back up the path through the wasteland towards the old town. As I drew closer, I could see that the shop-lined street was still busy with people, fetching last-minute provisions, chatting with friends, playing cards, eating meals at pavement tables, the heat from Ashfield grill cookers keeping them warm. Although I was hungry by now, I dared not stop to buy food, nor to thaw my frozen fingers. I slipped quickly past the end of the street and kept going until I found a whole row of deserted apartment blocks. The door of them was partially open. I pushed it hard to make enough room to squeeze through, listened for any sound that might mean it was occupied, then ran up the stairs right to the top floor and into a room at the front. A meagre thread of light penetrated through the cracked windows. The room was bare apart from a filthy blanket in one corner a pile of old electrical wire in another, and a scattering of litter across the floor. It's only for one night, I told myself. I sat down on the broken floorboards with my back against a wall. I was too scared and too cold to go to sleep. I kept hearing unfamiliar noises, creaks and scratches and rasps and whines. I prayed that there were no rats around. Surely they wouldn't climb that high. Part of me began to long for the comfortable bed in my room at the Chen's, but I reproached myself for even thinking that I wanted to go back. Then I heard footsteps on the stairs, two sets, men's voices. I grabbed the filthy blanket and pulled it over me in terror. I shrank into the corner, hoping that if I made myself as small as possible, I wouldn't be noticed. The footsteps kept on coming. The gr voices grew louder. They were outside the room. I heard a door creak, then close. The voices immediately became muffled. Two men had gone into the room opposite, and closed the door behind them. It was stifling under the foul-smelling blanket. I lifted it away from my face, only to be teased by the smell of food. The men were obviously eating next door. I could hear music, too. I was desperate for them to leave. Why couldn't they have chosen one of the other apartment blocks? Why mine? They were probably regular visitors. I wondered whether to steal out of the building while they had their door closed. But it was dark outside now, as well as freezing cold, and I was too scared to move in case they heard me. I could only hope that they would leave me alone in my room while they were made locked in theirs. After perhaps an hour, maybe two hours, the voices and the music stopped. I was struggling to keep my eyes open, but I stayed awake for another half an hour or so, before deciding that the two men must be asleep and that I was safe at least for a while. I lay down, pulled the collar of my coat round my ears, wrapped the blanket round the lower part of my body and hid my bag under it as well, then fell asleep myself. I woke again at dawn, stiff with cold and ravenous. All was quiet in the building. The ferry would leave, I judged, in about an hour. I had to be on it. I couldn't stay here another day and night, but how would I know whether it was safe to leave? I decided that the only thing I could do would be to make a dash for it. I waited for another nerve-wracking stretch of time. There was still no sound from the room across the hall. I stood up quietly and stretched my legs, picked up my bag, then moved silently towards the door. I peered round it and my heart skipped a beat. The door opposite was open. I listened hard, not a sound. The men must have gone already. I took a deep breath, leapt out into the hallway, then belted down the stairs, two at a time, and out through the front door. It had snowed during the night. A sprinkling covered the ground, smoothing its jagged edges and bleaching the greyness from the landscape. The murky sky suggested there was more to come. I hurried down the path, joining a steady stream of people who were also heading for the river. Their early morning chatter cheered me. A sense of excitement eclipsed my fears. As I drew closer to the waiting ferry, I scoured the quayside for the Chens, but saw no one of their grandeur. I mingled with a large group of women, who it appeared from their conversation, who were on their way to work at a factory further down the river, and boarded the ferry with them. It seemed an eternity before the engine started up, but at last they roared into action. The horn sounded, and we moved slowly, slowly away from the landing stage. Away from a period of my life, I was only too happy to leave behind. The ferry picked up speed. I breathed a sigh of relief. I was safe at last. I would stay on the ferry for as long as possible, then make my way home somehow or other, by bus or by train. It couldn't be that difficult, I thought, to work out a route back. 
I stood by the edge and gazed over to the far side of the river, where buildings lower down had been obliterated and small holdings abandoned. Higher up, another new town stood proud. Lucky people, aren't they? A rather overweight man had come to stand next to me. I looked at him, bewildered. He pointed across the water. Nice new homes they've got now. New jobs too, most of them. Nice warm factories instead of having to break their backs digging for a pittance. I didn't think my family would have agreed. Father had always refused to work in a factory, however much uncle had tried to persuade him. I didn't want to talk to this man, though. I just wanted to be alone with my thoughts. Are you going far? he asked. I nodded, but made no effort to continue the conversation, hoping he'd go away. Bit young to be on your own, aren't you? I'm older than I look, I said, trying to sound tough. Old enough to work, he continued. My wife and I were always on the lookout for girls to work in our factories. You won't find better. I don't want to work in a factory, I said. I'm going home. That's our loss then, said the man. I hope you have a good journey. He flashed me a smile before turning away. I was relieved that at that moment the ticket man approached me. Where to, miss? he asked. All the way, please. He told me how much I had to pay, and I reached into my bag to take out the money. I delved down to the bottom, my fingers itching to touch the fat wad of crisp notes Mrs Hung had given me. I couldn't find it. I could feel my face turning red, my heart thumping. I searched around with my hand, then opened the bag wider and pulled out my clothes to look underneath. The money wasn't there. "'Got a problem, miss?' asked the ticket man. "'My, my money? It's gone. Someone's taken my money!' I wailed. It hit me like a sledgehammer, the awful realisation that it must have been the men I had heard in the night. I knew something had been wrong that morning. It was the pile of electrical wire. It had gone. The men had come into my room for the wire. They had discovered me sound asleep. They had found my bag and stolen my money. I must have fainted at the thought of it, for the next thing I knew I was sitting on the floor of the ferry, being comforted by a tiny woman. "'Don't you worry, my darling,' said the woman. "'I've paid your fare. You just sit there until you feel better.' "'But the money!' I sobbed, as I realised again what had happened. "'I need it to get home. My mother's expecting me.' "'What a terrible stroke of luck you've suffered. "'But I'm afraid there's no use crying,' said the woman, not unkindly. "'What's gone is gone.' "'I hauled myself to my feet.' aware of the pitying stares of the other passengers. "'You don't understand,' I sobbed again. "'I need it for my mother. I can't go home without it.' "'That bad, eh?' sympathised the woman. "'I wonder if there's anything my husband and I can do to help you.' She called across the boat, and the fat man who had spoken to me earlier came over to us. "'This young lady's had her money stolen, poor thing,' she said to him. "'And there she was, saving it to help her poor mother. "'I don't know what the world's coming to,' said the man." It's always the good folk who get taken advantage of. We can help her though, can't we? urged the woman. Help her earn some money for her family? Like I told her, we employ a lot of young girls in our factories, said the man. But she doesn't want to work in a factory, so I'm afraid we can't really help. Oh, but it's good pay, my dear, the woman encouraged. Good pay, good conditions. You come with us and you'll earn enough in no time. You work hard enough, said the man, and we'll have you home for spring festival. Plenty of young ladies would jump at the chance, but you must make up your own mind. Spring festival, a month away. I could cope with that, couldn't I, after all I had been through. My heart skipped at the thought of how my mother's face would look if I walked through the door in time for spring festival, in time to give her a fistful of money to spend on our celebrations. What sort of factory? I asked. The best, said the man. A toy factory. Dolls, teddy bears, furry animals, rubber ducks, plastic lorries, everything, infused the woman. Lots of other young girls work there. Perhaps they would let me take something back for Lehu, I smiled to myself. We're Mr and Mrs Wang, the woman hold, held out her hand. Trust us, my dear, we'll see you're all right. I'm Lucy Ann, I said shyly, shaking first her hand and then his. Thank you for your help. Mr and Mrs Wang shared some food with me and asked me about myself. I told them a little about my family, but when they began to pry into my recent past, I said that I had worked as a domestic and left it at that. They seemed friendly enough, but I was worried at the thought that I was putting my well-being into the hands of complete strangers, and I instinctively felt that the less they knew about me, the better. I had no choice but to trust them, though. They were offering me a lifeline.